and it has to change. Do you know the purpose of the fivefold ministry? I bet you when we first came together, people were saying, I can't believe they have so many pastors. I don't understand why they have so many pastors. That's ridiculous. They should have one pastor. The reason you have the fivefold ministry is this. 1,800 pastors lead the ministry every month. 40% of pastors will not be in ministry in 10 years. 50% of pastors feel un unable to meet the needs of the job. 80% believe that pastoral ministry negatively affects their families. 45% of pastors say they've experienced depression or burnout to the extent they needed a leave of absence from ministry. 33% felt burned out within the first five years of ministry. There's only one way to alleviate all these pressures off of a pastor. You have to put the other four offices with them. You have to put the other four offices with the one. We're killing our pastors. We're killing them with what we say about them, how we view them. Well, my pastor can't do this. No fooling. He's a man or a woman. They can't. We slay our pastors. We tear them apart. We don't have the revelation of who they are as far as the fivefold ministry, or are they even part of the fivefold ministry? There are people who just love Jesus that become pastors that were never, ever supposed to be a pastor. So what happens is they go through burnout. They go through heartache. This isn't what I got in for, and then they walk away. It's no different than any other job. If you go in to become a teacher and you don't like children, at some point in time, you're going to go get a different job. Right? It's truth. And that's what happens with these people. So you have to have the other four offices to support the pastors. You have to have them. Oh, my goodness. Recognize who they are. You can look at me. You, you know me well enough. You say, he's really not a pastor. By definition, he's not. He may have the title. Pam and I may have the title together. Remember, we move together in the same type of giftings. The two become one. You need to understand. When you look at us, you say, well, they have some pastorally pieces, but they're more of this. And that's why we're doing the teaching on the gifts, because you want to understand what do they move in? Do they move in encouragement? Yes. I know we move in encouragement. Do they? Are they kind? I hope so. I try to be. But we, you know, the motiva motivational gifts, we try to work the motivational gifts in through us to touch the body because there has to be balance. Pastor Michael told you, if you have an apostolic and a prophetic uh, uh, head, headship to a church, it's all about this. It's all about heaven to earth, and then you have people running out the back door because the needs are not being met. I move here. You guys know I move here. I move here. But we try to stay balanced, and where we need other gifts, I ask for the gifts of miracles to move through me when I'm laying hands. Because right then and there, I need that working, that, that working gift to come in to Ed to put the brand new lungs in him. I need that to work right then and there. So I may be working in an apostolic type anointing, but it's more, it was a teaching anointing too so that you could see it being done. So that when you walk out of here, you get in a conversation with somebody at Applebee's and you say, you know, I've been, I, I'm okay, but I've been having this issue here. Then you know how to lay hands on them so that God can come and touch them. I was, I, I said that I was supposed to teach on healing and miracles today. And Pastor Michael uh, sent me a text last week and just said he's going through his notes and he's getting to the point where he re he, Revelation was coming. He goes, Joel, you got to do these. You got to do the other three offices. You got you to do the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And I was like, oh, because you, you know how, you know why. Because I just love miracles. I just love miracles and healings. I just love seeing the kingdom work. But there also has to be that balance of the, the there has to be the educating piece of the word that goes along with the demonstration of the kingdom. So I said, Lord, 
you got to show me how I'm going to do this. Because to me, teaching on the house, uh, the offices, I go, mm, you know, that's kind of interesting to me, but not, not, not a whole lot. No, no, I'm being honest. I'm going to be honest and upright. But he said to me, this is what you do. They're fish. We're fishers of men. He goes, catch them, clean them, prepare them. Evangelist, catch them. Pastors, clean them. Teachers, prepare them. I go, Lord, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And I, and I started, not, then I really started thinking about it. I really enjoy uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 9 going into 10. I, I always get to that scripture because it, it tells us that Jesus has this revelation. He, he always knew he was a man, but here he was. He's looking at all these people with all these different needs. Now, you realize that Jesus carried all five offices. He was complete. He had it all. But he has this revelation, and he goes to the disciples. They're not apostles yet. They're disciples. And he tells them, you need to start teaching about the kingdom of God. You need to start healing the sick. You need to start raising the dead. You need to start casting out demons. And you need to start cleansing the lepers. Because the revelation is that one man cannot do it by themselves. It takes a whole body to do it. So I'm, I'm reading that, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's, that's, that's quite amazing, because when Jesus lifts, when he ascends to heaven, all five gifts at that time go with him, and then he releases those gifts to the body, and he said, some will be called to be apostles, and some are going to be called to be prophets, and some will become evangelists, and some will become pastors, and some will become teachers. And I was thinking, how awesome is it that our God built this plan on how to use the body in so many different facets, and how he makes you work together. He makes you work together. The apostle has to work with the prophet and the teacher and the, uh, the evangelist, and the, uh, the pastor. He has to, because if they don't work together, then the church will collapse. But if they work together, they can start building the foundation to the church. Do you understand these offices? You may see them up here, but they're really down here. They build the foundation of the church. They're not up here. Pastors are not up here. Apostles are not up here. Prophets are not up here. Evangelists are not up here. Teachers are not up here. They're down here. They are about safety and support. They are about keeping the body safe and about supporting the body by educating them. Don't put them on high. Don't put them on high because then they'll be out of position to build a foundation. They are down below building the foundation, teaching people how to walk in the kingdom, and then you build it up together as a body using everyone's gifts. Really important to understand that. It is important to get a biblical understanding of the fivefold ministry so that our churches will be healthy and functioning according to the will and plan of God. A couple years ago, Pastors Michael and Pastors Gina had the opportunity to go over to the Netherlands, and they went with Apostle Shirley. When they came back, the revelation hit them of the, they, they, they were already thinking about the importance of the fivefold, but it was there where they said, we're putting this into place. And what happened is, we're up in Weston Mills, and what happened is, as soon as we started bringing the five into place, the church started to grow. The church started to grow to a point where we said, what are we going to do because we don't have enough space? And then we decide, well, and then we're there as a team. There's 10 of us. We're there as a team. It's not two people making a decision that's going to affect the whole body. We make the decision. We'll put the church up for sale and see what happens. 
So we decide to put the church up for sale, and what happens is here. God brings us here. He opens up a door for the, for the fivefold to come down here to bring two bodies together. Most people will say, how did you do it? How? We can't even get our one body to get along, and we have two bodies that have come together to become one. It's because you had 10 pastors. We have two more added. We have the fivefold in place, and we try our best to honor God and hear his voice and, and walk out what he asks us to walk out. And because of that, ridiculous favor has happened to us. I can tell you about blessings, financial blessings, uh, the parsonage and all these other things that have happened that are just miraculous, but it's because I truly believe is because the fivefold was put together to manage a church. Why do you see some churches collapsing around you? There's too much of a burden put on that one person or that one couple. Too much. If you have harshly judged a pastor because of what they can't do, maybe you need to reflect inside and say, whoa, whoa, maybe I should have been praying for that pastor. You don't have to come into agreement with what they said or how they, what they did, but you need to pray that God will give them the revelation on how to build a five-fold ministry. Because if they don't, it's going to be torn down. It's going to come down. Now, Pastor Michael last week, he talked about the apostolic and the prophetic. You, I'm, going to, I'm going to read a little to you because it will keep me focused. Because, I, you know, I chase rabbits. So you need to understand the apostolic governs. An apostle is one called and sent by Christ to have the spiritual authority character, gifts, and abilities to reach and establish people in kingdom truth and order, especially through founding and overseeing local churches. An apostle has a burden to build something that didn't exist before. They lay the foundation of new local churches and see to it that they come into full maturity. They write it out. Full maturity. So apostle surely comes and you, get, you guys were already introduced to her. What are they doing over in the Netherlands? They are church planting. So she is over there as the apostolic order, the overseer of churches being planted in our, in, in our covering called RPN, Revival People Network. So she's over there and then she takes Michael and takes Gina with them amongst others to help establish. So Michael and Gina will go with the, with the apostolic and with the prophetic and with the worship piece. And they teach the people in the Netherlands what this looks like and how do you build it to sustain it. So Pat, uh, Apostle, what I, I believe she spent two to two and a half months of her summer in the Netherlands helping to build this culture because that's what apostles do. Prophets guide. Prophets reveal God's heart to his people, giving guidance to individuals and the body, giving revelation as well as interpretation, application, and timing. God has established prophets in his church, and we will not be complete if we reject their ministry out of fear. He made me say, when I read that, I started thinking about unity. And if you're here a couple Wednesdays ago, I shared out of Ephesians 4 the piece where it says there is one body, one spirit, there's one hope, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all. And it's through you all. And there, there has to be this recognition that there is none greater than in the kingdom. We just all have different gifts and responsibilities that God has placed upon us. It is the same anointing in all of us. It is the same Holy Spirit in all of us. My anointing is no less or no greater than anyone else's. It's the same anointing, but it's different giftings. And our willingness to use these gifts, that makes us different. And we must be different. We can't have a room full of arms. That's true. And that happens. 
When you walk into some churches, you know, when you visit other places, you'll recognize they all kind of look the same. It's almost like they've been hypnotized, you know. Pam and I have experienced, we walked into this one church, and we're just looking at the people go, have they been brainwashed? What is going on? They all look the same. They all reacted the same. You weren't allowed to be your own individual. And that's, that's perversion. That is, a, that is a perversion. That is an antichrist spirit that is taking hold in those houses. We need to pray for them, not talk them down, not, not beat them up, but we need to pray for them because they are, they're still our brothers and sisters. Do you know that as a, a physical brother to a brother and a sister, there are times where I make bad choices that affect them in the physical I make choices that glorify them or, or, or may benefit them, but I also make choices that aren't good for them. Do they cast me out? Do they say, well, he's no longer my brother? Families do that. Families do do that. So we need to understand who we are in, in the spiritual realm so that we stop beating each other up. You have to stop beating each other up, and you have to start seeing each other as equals. We're going to get to this when I get to the evangelism. So let's go there. It's going to take all five of us. The evangelist is the one who gathers. An evangelist carries a great burden for those who are not part of the kingdom of God yet. Can you say yet? Yet. 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 Because what's an evangelist think? I'm going to get them all. Yet. May not be saved yet, but they're going to be. May not know my big brother yet, but they're going to. May not have relationship with the father yet, but it's coming. They may have had it once before, but they're going to get it back. That is the evangelist. That's what they're going after. They have an anointing to preach the gospel that comes with great conviction and draws people to the Lord. They will often have signs and wonders following them to confirm their message. You know who Reinhard Bonnke is? You know who he is? 76 million plus people his ministry has led to Christ. He's German. Went through Africa. He's based out of the Orlando area right now. The reason he lives in the United States is because God told him that he is going to save the United States. So he moved his ministry into the United States, and he is doing a tour. He's 75, 76 years old. He is so simplistic in his teaching. The revelation of who you are and the power of the kingdom and the importance of salvation. If you don't... Christ for All Nations is the name of the ministry. Go look it up. It's incredible when you see a million people, a million people standing out before his teaching and the releasing of the kingdom to them. Deliverance takes place. Healing takes place. Salvation takes place. And then the evangelist piece in him says, now I have to get them with pastors. Because you know what the evangelist they're about winning the souls. It's not, they, it's not about raising them up in, in the kingdom. They go get them. They catch them. Then they get them to the pastors. So they, he, he, Reinhard ties them all to churches. He makes sure that they have some place to go after the meetings are done. See, the prime example of an evangelist in the New Testament is Philip. Do you know the term evangelist is only used three times in the Bible? Three times. So if you want to know what an evangelist looks like as far as in a, uh, as a disciple, you go read about Philip. He was one of the men chosen to serve the widows in Acts 6, six and he is the only one specifically called as an evangelist. That's Acts 21.8. In Acts 8, he obeys the Holy Spirit and brings the Ethiopian eunuch to a believing knowledge of Christ. So evangelists create converts while apostles create disciples. Their foremost desire is to see people come into the kingdom, then leaving the discipling to others. They love teaching others how to win people 
and never feel like they are actually doing enough and accomplishing their tasks. While they are grieved to see believers in differences regarding the lost, they do have an anointing to impart God's heart to the body. Evangelists are, are absolutely crucial to numeric growth in the body of Christ. So what drives an evangelist? I was reading this scripture. Um, I don't know where I was. Oh, I was, I, I, I was up in Buffalo. So I was, I was at a coffee shop waiting for some things to be made, and I went on to the app, the Fresh Fire app, and there's a reading piece in there, and it had Luke 17 and 16. So I, I started reading about the rich man in Lazarus. Let me read a little of this to you. It says, In time, this is uh, 1622 where I'm starting. The time came when the beggar died, Lazarus, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, in hell, where the rich man was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. The heart of the evangelist. Put yourself in heaven next to Abraham. And your co-worker is across the chasm. The person at Tim Hortons at the window is on the other side of the chasm. You're in heaven... And all they're asking for is a drop of water to help stop the torment. I think there's a little evangelism in all of us when we start reflecting on what the final outcome is going to be for our brothers and sisters who have not met the father or the bridegroom. I want you to think about this. The evangelist is going to go tearing after these people. But we all have the responsibility of evangelism. We cannot let our brothers and sisters be on the other side in Hades. We can't allow those, those that we work with to be in Hades. When you're looking across that great chasm with Abraham and you say, oh my God, I knew them. I passed them. I had an opportunity to share the kingdom with them. It is that type of stuff that drives the evangelist. That no soul shall be lost. No soul shall be lost. No brother and sister shall be lost. No son and daughter of God shall be lost. That is the heart of the evangelist. Now let's go to the pastor. The pastor guards. The pastor is the heart of the church. They are the shepherds who deeply care for their sheep, ready to lie down everything for them. They want them to be fed. They want them to grow. They want them to be equipped. They develop their giftings. They step into the callings of God for them. The pastors are the ones are going to go to the hospitals. The pastors are the ones, if you, you have a financial need, they give up their paycheck 
for you. The pastors are the ones that will leave things that are important to them to go take care of you. They have those hearts. They're going to be with the people. They're going to go through things with you. They are going to be the ones, when there's a funeral, they're by your side. When there's a birth, they're going to be with you. They're going to be celebrating. When there's need for a healing, they're going to show up and lay hands. Those are the pastors. They're going to teach you how to grow up in the kingdom. They're going to demonstrate the kingdom. They're going to teach you, and they're going to be with you as you go through it. Those are your pastors. When you look around our house, you can see Ted and Sue. You can see that all over them. That is who they are, and that's how they behave. That's what, that, that is how God has created them. They created them for that purpose, to meet your needs, to take care of you. They'll, make care, they'll take care of your needs spiritually, and they're going to take care of them physically. They're going to meet them in two different ways. Not that all of us don't, but it is their calling as pastors that puts their, design their heart to take care of all of you. Those are our pastors. Let me skip over this because we're going to go right into teachers now. Teachers are the ones who ground. Jeremy's a teacher. Cole's a teacher. Teachers teach and edify the church. They impart divine life and anointing to their listeners who become more hungry for the word of God. As the teacher illumines scripture and brings forth truth never seen by the, their listeners before. While prophets reveal the heart of God, the teachers revi- uh, reveal his mind. Prophets and teachers balance each other in the church, which can also create tension. Prophets have a revelation of hidden things in the future, while teachers of the hidden things in the word. Teachers reveal the specifics of the revealed truth, while prophets reveal the spectrum. While prophets possess foresight, teachers have insight. While prophets are risk takers, teachers move by understanding and are planners. Teachers are very essential in the body of Christ to give the sheep a good foundation of the word. I'm going to operate in evangelism, pastoral, and a teacher in the next five, six minutes. We're going to operate in those three houses. There's a piece of scripture that I want to share with you. James 1, uh, 1, 27, it says, Religion that our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows. So God spoke to me about the revelation of the orphan and the widow. We have the physical widows, those who have lost their spouse, and we have the physical orphans, those without a parent. But there needs to be a revelation of the spiritual widow in the spiritual orphan. In the kingdom of God, we are saved. We are saved brothers and sisters. We carry the Holy Spirit within us. But there's a whole nother group of brothers and sisters who are widows and orphans. I want you to notice the term widow can both be male and female the way I'm using it. You need to understand that the widows that we are called to care for, to teach how to live in the kingdom and then to set out are the people or our brothers or sisters who have yet to meet the bridegroom. The bridegroom mean Christ. Widows, let me say it again, widows can be both male and female. They are brothers and sisters of ours who have yet to meet the the bridegroom. There needs to become a passion in your heart to go and gather the brothers and sisters that were created by the hands of our Father 
and introduce him to our brother who is the bridegroom. The orphan. The orphans are the same population, but they need a revelation of who their father is. We have brothers and sisters that are, they act like orphans. They make choices that look like, hey, they've never been fathered. And the reason for that is they haven't been. They haven't been fathered in the kingdom. So you need to recognize that these people that, uh, that have, these brothers and sisters who have not found out who their brother is, their bridegroom, Jesus, they also don't know who their father is, Father God. It needs to come upon your heart. A hunger needs to rise up in all of you that you don't see those brothers and sisters on the other side. You don't look across that chasm and see them. We are guaranteed eternity at birth. Eternal hell or eternal heaven. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. It's one or the other. So you need to have the revelation. You got to get out of the flesh. You have to have the revelation. These are God's children who are my brothers and sisters. They may be doing things you don't agree with. They may be doing things that are like anti-Christ. They may be of other faiths. It is our responsibility to go get them and introduce them to the bridegroom and introduce them to the father. You have to go get the widows and you have to go get the orphans. If you have this, angel, uh, this evangelical piece in you that you go after them, we won't have enough room to house all these people in Olean. We won't have enough space because they'll be all over the place. But we have to go get them. It's got to pull on our heart. It has to pull on our heart.